Uh, yes. Also, if anyone uh, would like to request uh, Spanish translation service, we have Miss Jones with us tonight. Uh, please come see Miss Jones if you would like Spanish translation service. Thank you.
Okay. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so thank you guys for coming back. Appreciate all of your, uh, all your hard work. Like, like, like always, it's really uh, appreciate you guys spending your time after hours here working with us on this process. Um, this is our fifth meeting. We uh, had a public info session uh, a couple weeks ago. And um, so we've got some things to share with that. Everybody should have picked up a packet of information that has the public info session survey results. And I'll, I'll break those down a little bit. And then uh, continuing to look at the, the, the three options that we have and seeing if there's any ways that anything that uh, modifications or adjustments to those maps that we can make uh, tonight. So yeah, that's our, our agenda to review the survey results. Uh, have some small group discussions like we have had, and then uh, and then let and then we'll adjourn at 7:30. Here we are, fifth meeting. We have uh, we've covered a lot of ground up to this point. We have one more meeting in on December the 11th, where we are expected to, you guys as a committee are expected to finalize the recommendation to the school board at that um, at that meeting. So we've got tonight, and then that meeting. And then once that occurs, then the, the recommendation is uh, the process is really uh, leaves the hands of the committee and then it gets into goes into the hands of the school board and the school board. That recommendation will be made in February and um, the board will have a, a, a hearing uh, at this location to, to they'll be they'll be here and listen to the public. Oh, uh, Lock Raven High School Auditorium. Yes. OK, the hearing will be at the Lock Raven High School Auditorium in February, where the, the board will be uh, listening to the public's input and what they have to say, and they're making a decision in March. So like we do every time, I'm just going to recap the objectives and some of our considerations and rules. Um, we are here to provide capacity relief at Pleasant Plains Elementary School. Um, we've talked about this a lot, but Pleasant Plains Elementary School is, uh, is well over capacity, 123%, 122% utilized. Uh, they've exhausted every last mean possible to, um, to address their overcrowding. They don't have any more space for portables. They've got uh, a high class sizes, and uh, they're just out of space. They're out of options. And I know that uh, we've talked a lot about um, having uh, other schools are nearing capacity, but really what we have to do here is focus on a plan that's best for all children in this region and not just one school or one, uh, or one community. And so it's kind of share the pain, share the gain, knowing that, that, you are, that other schools in the area may increase utilization and they're still growing, but we really need to help our neighbor out here with Pleasant Plains. They, they have an immediate critical need in uh, providing some capacity relief. We want to support diversity among schools that reflect the community in the school system and create viable and successful boundaries to effectively utilize available capacity at adjacent schools. Um, we are, uh, we want to, these are our primary considerations, and this is from Rule 1280, which I've already mentioned, we want to make efficient use of capacity in the affected schools, so try to make sure that we can make things equitable among the three schools that we're looking at, but be mindful of other, of, of all of the other factors. Looking at diversity as well, and trying to see if, can we improve the diversity? What we don't want to do is make any, uh, make any negative impacts on demographic diversity as we continue our work. There's other things to consider as we work through our process and as you look at the boundaries and look at these, keep evaluating these three options. Maintain the continuity of neighborhoods. Um, look at the impact of transportation and pedestrian patterns. And I think that, you know, we, we know that a lot of these, there's ways, there's goods and bads, things that we can improve, but there are some things that are inevitable that, w it's the, that things may not be better. We can't always make things better in terms of these criteria because we have to look at all the different factors. And transportation is one of those. And if you've, we've seen and circled the wagon looking at all these areas, and no, ma no matter which way we cut it, uh, there are going to be additional students added to Hampton, and their, their transportation commute is going to be larger, longer. But, um, but you know, that's just that's sort of just the, the, the way it is with the geography and, this, and what we're working with here. Uh, minimize the number of times any individual students are reassigned. That doesn't apply here. Looking at long-term enrollment capacity trends, we've talked about, we're working with September 30, 2018 numbers. Those numbers, uh, there's been a lot of conversation about using uh, incorrect data. The data is not incorrect, it's, it's using data from 2018. And we do have information 
that we've given you on September 30, 2019. And, um, and so that's some information that we will look at um, and that we've provided you through, through the course of the study. Um, location of feeder school boundaries, so looking at what the impact is on uh, elementary to middle school progression. And, um, and additional considerations is using geographic features such as railroads, creeks, and major highways, if at all possible. So a couple of follow-ups from meeting four. Um, there was, there's been a lot of talk about the data, okay? September 30, 2018, it was, a, it was a, in a lot of the survey uh, comments, and you guys have even talked about it. And the, but the, there's, I think that there are also some misconceptions about the data and th saying, okay, we got our numbers as this as of September 13th, and it's uh, September 30th, and the enrollment just keeps going up. It's just like a straight trend line going up, like uh, exponential growth that occurs throughout the year. Um, so looking at, just taking a look at the data, let's look at what we are, what we're working with is September 30, 2018. And you can see the imbalance that exists here, and that Pleasant Plains is 122% of their capacity. And uh, Halstead's 92%, Hampton's 83% as of September 30, 2018. This is September 30, 2019. You can see Halstead went up to 98%. Hampton went from 83 to 86%. And Pleasant Plains went from 122 to 125%. So there are all three of the schools are going up. This, you know, you, it may be a different, uh, you may have to look at this differently if we saw two of the three schools going down and one was going up. But the trend in this area is that enrollment is going up in all three buildings. So it is all, it is all relative. Hit Pleasant Plains is not getting any relief through demographic inertia or students aging out or, uh, you know, uh, enrollment declines as a result of projected enrollment. So this, the, the study area was 98% as we were looking at it with our data, and now it's 102%. So it is, it is relative in thinking about this, and we want to make sure that we don't uh, tr try not to ca cause any, create any new issues, but we definitely need to provide capacity relief for Pleasant Plains. No matter wh how way, what way you cut it and what you end up recommending, Pleasant Plains needs relief. They don't have any more space to, uh, to accommodate additional students. Then, then looking at, yeah, let's go. So, just to to comment on that, I I I, I get what you're saying, but w one of the problems when we as Pleasant Plains parents came into this was that for the last five years our attendance has gone up, and the school system projected us to go down. So th I think that is one of the reasons. No, no one is. You know, you're right. Fifteen students is not making a big deal. But when you look over the long term, over five years, ten years, when the school system says, oh, you're eventually going to get back to where you're supposed to be, but you keep going up, that's a different story. And I think that's why people get more upset about it. No one's saying, no one's saying it's exponential growth, but over the long run, over the last several years, we've increased. If you look yeah. at the school year, we increase throughout the school year. So I think that's why people keep bringing this up and why there's such a an issue with using data from the beginning of last school year. Yeah, and so in, we've been studying it and, and, and uh, supporting you with this conversation, giving you new enrollment data. Um, and I don't think anybody around this table or on the staff disagrees that enrollment has increased in Pleasant Plains. And um, you know, I think that um, as Pleasant Plains continues to gain students, they just their, their issue keeps getting more, more dire in terms of what they can and can't do with their students. And I don't know, could, if the Pleasant Plains principal, is it possible, could you give us a, just a little bit of a preview of what does it look like at Pleasant Plains in terms of your school and the overcrowded situation? Sure, sure. Um, right now we have about 712 students in our school and we are a state rated capacity of 545, which means our lunch shift begins at 10.30 in the morning and does not end until 1.35 in the afternoon. Um, with that being said, the cafeteria is full the entire time that we have those hours of lunch. Um, and if anybody has been in an elementary school cafeteria, you know what that's like for that longevity of a period of time. Um, it gets very loud and it gets very chaotic. So um, that's one of the conditions that we have to deal with on a daily basis. Um, in addition, we have two PE classes going on in the gym every day. Um, when we have assemblies or something, we have to reschedule um, because the, the gym area is where we hold assemblies. Um, so if that's 
the case, then our PE teachers have to push into classrooms or take their PE class outside if the weather is conducive to that. Um, we do have a population of um, ESOS students, which they receive, of, of course, um, ESOS services. Um, we have eight trailers where four of those trailers, or relocatables, excuse me, <laughs> are fourth grade classrooms. The transition time from those classrooms to the building and back it takes about seven minutes, um, and that's on a good day if everybody's in line and ready to go. Um, in addition to that, we only have two sets of restrooms for 712 children. Um, and in each of those restrooms, there's about four stalls per restroom. So anyone can do the math and realize that we're really in dire need of additional restroom space as well. Um, when it rains and our children are coming and going from the relocatables, we get wet <laughs> or we stay put until the rain stops. Um, and I know that other places have had that experience with relocatables as well. Um, just the comings and goings of the day, you know, arrival and dismissal um, is, can be very chaotic. We have to have all staff hands on deck because we want to keep our children safe. But um, with that many students in the hallways and that many students coming and going from the front door, the back door, um, it makes for a, a real challenge to keep everyone safe. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think it's, you know, it, we acknowledge that the enrollment is, is increasing in all three of the schools in the study area from the data that we've been looking at and the data that the current September 30, 2019. We wanted to also just give you a snapshot of what November 19th, so in a couple weeks after the official enrollment, what that looks like in terms of enrollment. And you can see Halstead has, uh, has gone up. Um, Hampton has continued to go up. And Pleasant Plains is, is going, has gone up as well. So, um, but the thing is, is that they've gone up, but they haven't gone up drastically. The numbers have, between September 30th enrollment and the November 19th, once you get to September 30th and after that, you know, you have ebbs and flows. There's always students enrolling and withdrawing, but uh, it starts to stabilize a little more, and that September 30th is typically, that's why we, we use the same point in time as a basis for projections and all that kind of stuff. And so, um, but you could see the enrollment has increased by a total of 13 students, and it's distributed evenly across all schools since September 30. So, that, so it's not a... a a straight upward trend line in terms of the growth, but you still are growing. And I think that's, that certainly is not something that we are uh, denying or um, you know, don't disagree with you on this matter. There were some other, a lot of questions at the public information session. Well, what about the neighboring schools? What about Stonely or what about um, Oakley and uh, you know, these other schools that are just in, around our adjacent study area? And we've talked about this uh, with you guys before but we wanted to recap this again. So you could see, looking at the other schools that are adjacent to this and what their utilizations are, you can see there is not um, a magical solution where there's a school next door that has a lot of available space. Um, Cromwell Valley shows at 89%, but Cromwell Valley is designed as a, as a partial magnet school. It has a walkable area. The, the only boundary for Cromwell is the students that can walk to that school. And that school is populated via magnet applications. And they are still max, they're still working through that process of, of maximizing the uh, fully enrolling the school with magnet applications. So that's why you see it at 89%. They're still accepting those applications. And, and then within a year or so, that building will be at 100%. They can cap their enrollment using the magnet application process. So there really is no other, and you can see the relocatables that are being in use at these other buildings next, uh, adjacent, there really is no boundary. Or if we extended the study area to, to another level of adjacency, it wouldn't help resolve. There's no other solution with schools next door. So that's something that to try to dispel that or to let, the, let you guys and let us, certainly the public understand sort of the nature of this area and what we can and what we can't do. Um, so another question that, we've that we saw at the public information session was, will this boundary change impact capital planning in this area? So the district recognizes that this is really a, um, it's a stopgap measure to give some immediate relief to Pleasant Plains, but this is not designed or intended to fully resolve the overcrowded, overcrowding in this area. I think we acknowledge that, that and the district acknowledges that this is not going to help 
solve the problem of overcrowding in this area. Um, overcrowding exists in places all over this county and communities all over the county. Um, and this is not, this is, this, this is just this, the same scenario that we see in a lot of other places. But it, we definitely acknowledge that capacity relief will not address, this boundary study is not gonna address the long-term overcrowding in this region. And, um, and the overall uh, seats needed in this area will be considered as the district and the county work to develop their 10-year capital plan. So they're looking at all schools in the county. They have to make sure that they balance out the needs and identify the needs for all the schools across this county, all 112 plus thousand students. And so um, they're doing their best to make sure that that's equitable and sharing, sharing the resources and making sure that they're equitable across the county. And, um, and so that's, that's something that needs to be said and understood. So we had a public info session. Uh, I think we had about 60 or so, maybe more people at, that, at this location uh, when we had our public information session. Had a lot of good conversations around maps with people and talking about the options. Uh, we had an online survey that went from October 30th to November 13th to let the public um, give us some input, which we have provided a summary report for you. I'm gonna break it down a little bit here. Um, 283 people responded to the survey. So 283 total response to the survey, which was good turnout, good input, that good feedback that we got from the public. One of the things I wanna remind or tell the committee is that use this survey input as just an additional piece of information as you evaluate the options. Don't use this as the end all decision on which one you think is the best plan. It's not a popularity vote. The one that has the most approval and, and likes doesn't necessarily mean that that's the best option. You really need to evaluate this information and look at the imp input and feedback that's been provided and see uh, and, and, and use this, just uh, accompany this with all the other data and statistics that you've been looking at. And always stay focused on the overall objectives and considerations. So here's a little bit of a, a breakdown on some of the feedback. So the public was asked their overall opinion towards an option um, and then we break it, we gave them the, the options of strongly in favor, somewhat neutral, somewhat opposed, or strongly opposed. And when you look at how it breaks down, it, um, it, you could see the breakdowns of, of how the feedback has been received. You will notice that there are a large number of strongly opposed and somewhat opposed across the board. And looking at the data, and I think in a future slide, you'll see that, that is the majority of that is from Hampton Elementary School respondents. The majority of them were, were opposed to all options, um, and, um, and that was something that, um, that exists in the survey data. Uh, there, wasn't the, there was a lot of the comments that we saw from that was that uh, the concern with the Hampton community is that they're growing and that we're gonna overcrowd them and they're gonna continue to get overcrowded. And that's, that's certainly a valid concern, but we have to also think holistically in the big picture and, and, and try to share the pain and share the gain here with this area and try to help provide some capacity relief. Um, you could see we had about 95, uh, 95 people uh, uh, were in favor strongly or somewhat in favor of option A, 80 were strongly or somewhat in favor of option B, and 98 were strongly or somewhat in favor of option C. So you had some, there can't always focus on the negatives and what people don't like. You also have to try to glean the positives and see what, what can we do and, and there are people who do support um, all three of these options and think that they are good plans. We break it down by elementary school zone because we ask them what elementary zone you live in. So we wanted to see the respondents, how they felt based off of elementary zone. And this is what I was saying. If you look at this, you could see, if you look at strongly, um, strongly opposed and somewhat opposed and how it's breaking down, you can see the Hampton community is, was, was overwhelmingly uh, the skewed toward the Hampton community who were strongly or somewhat opposed to all three options. There are still strongly and somewhat opposed for Pleasant Plains and a few for Halstead, um, but the majority of it does come from the Hampton Elementary, uh, people who live in the Hampton Elementary zone. Um, the, uh, looking at the strongly in favor and somewhat in favor, you can see the Pleasant Plains community Really, uh, there's a lot of support for option A from Pleasant Plains. I think it's because it gives a good balance of utilization and gives Pleasant Plains some capacity relief. A little bit fewer supported option B from Pleasant Plains, and then option C is a little, uh, a little bit less than that. So 
you know, it's, it's fairly balanced. Um, and you can also see that there are a number of people from Hampton who supported option B and, um, and option C, particularly Hampton community uh, members. There was the majority of the, of the three options from the Hampton community, the option C was the one that they liked the best from, the, from, from their perspective. And so uh, you can look at this and take this and look at the study of the maps and try to get an understanding of why and some of that um, uh, for, for their feedback. But that's how it breaks down by, by people, uh, but based on where people live in this uh, community. We asked them if you support an option, what was, the, what was the rationale? What was the reason why you supported an option? Um, you could see that uh, the majority of respondents who supported an option, and uh, all, all three, uh, or well, these first two, was the effective use of capacity. A lot of that's providing capacity relief to Pleasant Plains, giving them uh, a good amount of capacity relief. I think option A brings all the schools, as of September 30, 2018, below 100 percent, so it gives you the best balance of utilization among the three schools. Um, option B does, does that as well. Option C was more maintained neighborhood continuity. I'm thinking that this may be um, some of the things that we saw over west of the Halstead zone where you take, put that entire community on the west end of the, of the major road from Halstead into Pleasant Plain, into uh, Hampton. Maybe my, my take on that may be that, uh, may be what's driving some of that. But um, take a look at that and see what you, what you think about, about, um, about this. We ask them if you're concerned or if you're opposed an option, what was your primary concern? Um, the majority of this was inefficient capacity use. Um, you could see across all three. And this, this goes back to the feedback that we received that I shared that, that I studied and looked at from the, the Hampton community in concerns of further overcrowding their school when they, they're nearing capacity and uh, adding more students to them is going to bring them to an over, uh, further overcapacity situation. I know that Hampton does have more available space out there to accommodate, to, to, to help uh, if, they, if they do start to get over capacity or get over capacity, they have other methods to help provide some relief strategies at Hampton, such as they've got some space to add uh, relocatables and things like that. There's other relief strategies that could be considered in, uh, at, on that site where that doesn't exist in uh, Pleasant Plains. So we have not modified these three draft options. They're the same three drafts that we've shared with you at the, um, at the public meeting. Um, everything is draft. We can look at this and nothing is set in stone. Does anybody, before I get any further, does anybody on the committee want to share any thoughts, any takeaways from the public meetings or any other comments about the, about the options or anything that relates to this, to this work? I don't think anybody denies the, the need for capacity relief at Pleasant Plains. I think um, I've heard and I've heard others express, I've expressed myself concerns about not knowing what long-term impact each of these options may have <coughs> on each of the schools. So you can give us numbers to show the impact based on enrollment numbers from last year but what I need to know is that for option A, one year, two year, three years from now, what is that going to look like for that school? Because that's going to impact our you know, decision making to know what the long term impacts of these options are for each of the schools involved. Okay, and so we do not do uh, projections based uh, off of the options, but there is projected enrollment information um, that the district has, has put out there. We've also shared future residential development information so you can see where the, you know, where the residential developments are and uh, the location of those. And, um, and so I, I think that um, you know, we've done our best to give you the information to help support that understanding. Um, but again, this I think it further, further goes back to Knowing that this is not going to be a um, going to solve all the problems, and this is going to this area is going to continue to be evaluated and reviewed to try to figure out how they can provide additional capacity relief. Um, but we do not have projected enrollment for the options. That's not something that we will have uh, 
for for the district um, for this uh, committee <laughs> as we do our work. But you know, there's uh, information on the developments and the projected enrollment that's been provided to you um, over the course of this this process. Do you have what in particular? What concerns do you have about the the future? Um, well, most of the projected development in the m information we are provided here, all of the ones impact Hampton Elementary School. Um, there are others that I've heard mentioned that aren't even in that map that was provided. Um, so are there other project um, potential developments that are gonna impact any of these schools in the next one, two, three years? Uh, I don't know, and when we go back to the projections, I think um, as it was raised before, they were projecting declines in enrollment, and we see that that's not the case. So we can't rely on the past projected <laughs> enrollment <laughs> numbers, obviously. Um, so I don't feel like we have all the information that we truly need to make the best decision that's in the best interest for all of the schools that are involved in this process. Yes, um, as Matt already said, I know we all recognize that this isn't going to be a long-term solution. Um, as far as what developments are included and not included, we typically only include approved developments that have been approved by Baltimore County Planning. So when we do projections, if it hasn't been approved and it's still a concept phase, it's not something that's really going to impact the student generation for probably the next four or five years. Um, so those are not in, um, included in projections. Um, as for what I think, um, even the information we provided you, I think um, those developments are still in concept phase. I don't think that, the, I think there's a note on there that those aren't even approved by Baltimore County Planning yet as well. So um, a date on what, when those students may be hitting the schools has not been determined yet. Yeah, the last time I looked at the binder, uh, there's a development on Cowpen that was stated in the map as just being agricultural, and there's massive amounts of homes going in there, which I'm sure will have some children going to Hampton, so that should be taken into account. Yeah, so one of the comments I w wanted to, oh, it was a kind of a question and then a comment. So when, from the survey, I know you asked where the student, or where the person was supposed to go. Did was there a question about whether they actually went there? The we asked where they live. Okay. That's where we asked. Because the, yeah. the reason I asked is I think the largest group of people that I spoke to at the meeting last time was were actually parents that don't send their kids to Pleasant Plains and were coming to find out if they could send their kids to a different school. So, you know, I think that the development uh, that the development in the future is certainly important, the things that you have to factor, but I think that you also have to look, take a step back and look at the big picture, uh, like I said. Uh, Pleasant Plains is out of options. They need capacity relief. Even if enrollment is growing, future development's gonna occur. Hampton is an area that's m much larger zone, so it's certainly gonna get um, more growth and residential development. Um, and so any way you cut it, though, um, you need to, we need to provide that capacity relief for Pleasant Plains because they're out of options. Um, other schools in the area do have options to help, uh, some additional options to help bridge that gap until they get a permanent solution. And so um, it's just important to know that, that the, the do nothing option here and just saying, well, we can't do anything because we know that school's gonna grow and that is not an option. We have to do something to give uh, that school some relief. Do we have a microphone? <laughs> All right, that's a good segue. So I guess my question is, what is the next step for this committee? Are we putting forth um, sort of a tentative, I know it's a draft, and that's been um, emphasized. And I, my understanding is the school board will ultimately vote on that, and is there, a chance that they will say, no, this doesn't work, go back? Yes, it's possible. The board has the ability to do whatever they want with the recommendation. Um, it's most common that the board 
Um, in most t processes that I work with across the country, the board typically approves a plan, the recommendation, because they acknowledge the hard work and hours you guys have spent in studying this and looking at all the different options. But it's not uncommon for them to make its minor adjustments to a plan to try to make it better, that they, if they feel it's better. So yes, your, the task, the charge for this group is to bring one recommendation, one map to the, to the board for, for consideration. And then the board, it's in their hands, and the board has the ability to make changes to that um, however they see fit. And maybe a follow-up. So when this is presented to the board, do we editorialize at all about why we've made the choices that we've made, or will they have access to some kind of rationale? When, uh, when we present to the board, um, I will present the recommendation to the board, and I will uh, do my best to tell the story to the board on what, uh, how, the, how we got to that recommendation and give them some background and answer any questions the board may have. And staff is always there as well, even when I'm not there at other board meetings to help give to support that conversation. Um, so yeah, we do our best to tell the board. Um, and I think the, all of this is recorded, so I think at leading up to this, board members go back and do their homework. They do research. They look at the live streams and see what was discussed, if there's any questions. So there's a lot of materials there for them to be able to, to catch up and, and see what, you know, if they had any question, they'd go to any meeting and kind of see what discussions were had at that particular meeting. Just to confirm that, <coughs> so the website contains all the videos from all of our meetings, contains all the materials that the committee has reviewed, including all the evaluation exercises that you've done and your um, the uh, strengths, well, weaknesses, opportunities uh, analysis uh, that were that were completed. So the board really does have a uh, and and all the e public emails also that we've received and logged onto the website. So the board really does have access, just like the public, to a wealth of information that the committee's considered throughout the process. So I'm just going to do a quick recap on the three options. I know that you guys are pretty well attuned to these, and um, and tonight we would like you to, I'm going to do a little recap on these, see if there's any adjustments that you want to make to the maps, maybe if you like a, something of one and something of another, maybe make any fine-tuned adjustments to the maps. Um, could be a modification of any of these three, or it could even be development of a new one that may be a hybrid. Um, option A does have the best balance of utilization and that all the three schools are equitable in terms of uh, capacity, um, uh, the available capacity. Uh, Hampton Elementary's uh, demographic diversity does go, does, uh, does improve. They, uh, this area right here is in, Hamp is in Pleasant Plains right now, and this is Pleasant Plains area right here. So this is added into Hampton, this is added to Hampton, and then Hampton also picks up a section of Halstead right here in this map. And then Halstead picks up a section of Pleasant Plains that's walkable to, to Halstead Elementary in this, in this map. Um, this does have a three, it's a, a three-way split of elementary to middle school to two, I think a couple of the other options have four-way splits because of the nature of uh, where the, how the middle school zones come in through here. So we tr it's not something we like to have, but uh, this, this one does feed into four middle schools in this, in this option. So the, some of the maps do do that, and some of them feed into three. And it's not something that we can, we can avoid because we're not making any middle school adjustments here. Um, this does impact the largest number of students of all three options. Um, I know that Halstead had given us feedback and talk, looking at that and uh, concerns about adding too many students to Halstead um, and this and as, as well as, you know, so we're hearing it from Halstead as well as Hampton. Um, the Halstead community um, says that although, um, you know, you're adding students to us, but our, our school has the greatest need in terms of the, they have the uh, highest percentage of uh, low income students and things like that. And so in, in, in settings like that, they need to have more space to give individualized instruction and things like that to, to the students in that school. So 100% so utilization at Halstead may be, uh, w could, could be much, much greater of uh, an issue than 100% at uh, like a Hampton Elementary School because of some of the, this, this, some of the demographics and the needs of the, of the children. Option B impacts the least amount of students. This region right here feeds into, uh, oh yeah, yeah. Um, <coughs> is, that a, is that the same for Pleasant Plains? Because I think our uh, free and reduce is similar to theirs. Like why wouldn't we get the extra? <coughs> yeah, room? I think it's, you know, it's certainly, Pleasant Plains is, there's no doubt that 
you're already so high. Um, the the free reduced meals at Pleasant Plains is currently we're at as of eighteen nineteen is uh, fifty nine percent, and uh, Halstead seventy six percent. So Halstead is much is a uh, higher by um, almost twenty percentage points, and then Hampton Elementary is twenty percent free and reduced meals, um, and so. Um, you know, Halstead does it. Really, we don't move the needle much on free and reduced meals. Hamptons goes up in all three options from 20 to 25 or 26. And Pleasant Plains goes from 59, stays right on 59 to 60. And, uh, and Halstead stays around the same. But, um, but yeah, so that's, so yeah, you certainly have a higher, a majority of your students are free and reduced meals at Pleasant Plains. But, um, but it's like 59% as opposed to 76%. didn't know that you get room to have the kids. I mean, do you know what I'm saying? Like you said that you would leave room at Halstead. Yeah, you know, and it's not necessarily leave room, but just be mindful of that, of, of the, that they, they require more space for us individual with special instruction and things like that. Yeah, I mean, they're not saying you don't, no, but yeah, I mean. Yeah, so like, you know, Pleasant Plains at you know, 122%, you guys are the most critical need here. You're really what's, what's driving the need for the study in its entirety. Yeah. Um, so this, in this option, you do get the same benefits of, of option A. You get the, the demographic uh, ben, uh, improvement at Hampton in here. Um, Pleasant Plains is still over 100% in here, so Pleasant Plains gets capacity relief by losing this in this region, but they don't, they don't uh, get as much as some of the other options. And so they're still over 100%, um, 104% and as of 18, and that's higher now as we've discussed. And Hampton still feeds into four different uh, middle schools. Option C is a different look in that this is one that keeps this area in Pleasant Plains, but then Pleasant Plains loses this region across the uh, major road here from Halstead, this feeds into Hampton, and then the Hampton also picks up this area around Pleasant Plains. Um, you still have uh, you still have a high utilization at Pleasant Plains. This map does feed Hampton into three different elementary schools um, as well. Uh, uh, middle school. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. So um, so those. That's just a quick recap of the three options. Um, and uh, what we'd like you to do is, is do like we, we've done before, is to break you guys into some small groups and just kind of study it, see is there anything, is there any stone unturned here that we need to explore, anything to try to make changes to and make improve the maps, make them better or possibly hybrid maps. Um, you should have markers and things like that to be able to do, um, to do your markups on the work. Um, we do have a, a, there's a sheet of paper that lists the pros and cons of each option. We'd like you to do that to kind of just understand and explore each option. Uh, and then, so we'll give you some time to do that. And just another, just another ad additional study of this at this meeting before you guys finalize the recommendation at the next meeting. Any questions on that? Okay, so we'll give you some time to do that. And we'll, we'll be going around and helping see how we can support you.
guys. I think uh, if you guys are ready as a group, uh, as your groups, we can go ahead and just uh, share some of your thoughts and your comments with the rest of the with the rest of the committee. Um, and so, uh, why don't we why don't we start with the red group over here? Um, I know that you guys had some things written down, so let's just 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 give us a recap of some of your conversations that you've had. So for option A, we briefly talked about that that would be providing the most um, capacity relief for Pleasant Plains. However, we really didn't view that as much of a strength because the numbers would be far over capacity for Halstead Academy, putting them at over 110% capacity. It also separates the Glendale community for Halstead Academy. Option B, a strength would be the fact that it keeps major daycare provider intact for Halstead Academy. And it, the weakness, um, I'm sorry, another strength would be that there's no impact of raising capacity at Halstead Academy. And option C, the strength would be Halstead would be an all walker school. And um, the only buses they would be having would be for their special needs students or displaced students. And a weakness, a couple weaknesses, one of Halstead's major daycare providers would no longer be in the Halstead zone. And this option also splits a major community within the Halstead zone. That's the area that's right um, in this area? Correct. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's a, a lot of dense uh, row homes and things in that area. It's apartment complexes. Apartment complexes, as well. yeah. Yes. And I think it's the current line between Halstead and Pleasant Plains here does that already, but it, you're saying it further divides and further sort of segments an area. Um, any other thoughts um, on on the options? Anything that you thought like any uh, any considerations for any boundary changes to any of these three options, or um, that you guys have thought about? Not to say that you have to. I'm just okay. Just more evaluating the the viability of the three options that we have here. What about you guys? Did you guys have any uh, want to add to that conversation? Any comments or? thoughts that you guys had about the three options and some of the conversations you had over the last 15, 20 minutes? Um, I think we had a lot of the same um, observations. Option A, it doesn't do good things for Halstead. Um, Overall, we liked that option C, is it option C, had, uh, does not add a fourth middle school to Hampton um, mm -hmm. and keeps the apartment complex that's, I guess, 302, 301 area together um, where it's divided on the other two. Down just in this region right here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like a yeah. giant apartment community mm -hmm. complex. Um, mm -hmm. And so. Okay. Oh, but on C, for some reason, there's still that one little yellow orange triangle. Okay, this, this little section right here. Yeah, it doesn't have any students listed, yeah. but it's just sort of weird looking. That's a residual. Uh, shift or adjustment that needs to be made and all that's planning block 319 I'll take note of that there's okay then there's two <laughs> planning block 221 it unless it's just the tip I don't know what that is I guess it's just that's, I think it's that's part, part of, the, of larger. the larger block maybe Okay. That goes all the way. Okay, so yeah. it's just a miscoloration. It's somehow. yeah, it's kind of the way that the planning block is shaped. It goes right. up along this road to pick up all sides of Asgard. Right. So I think on C. I don't know if it, that's actually part of two nineteen or two two one, but in either case, it probably should be purple. On C, but. Okay, so it's uh, so planning block three nineteen, and what planning block number is that one again? I don't. I can't tell by the way the letters are. So this is if 221. It's that's 220. That would be 220. Okay. Would be At any rate, I think it's okay. just like the 
it's not its own planning block. It's part of one of those others, I think. Okay, so 220 up near Taylor. Okay, and yeah. we'll, we'll evaluate that and see if it does make sense. I think it may be picking up students on the, the same street, residential homes, homes on there. Yeah. And I'll just take, I'll take note to evaluate that. Yeah, I can't tell if it's, it's on there. Or it's okay. All right. So yeah, that's, that's good. Any other, um, any other is comments? There, is there a chart that exists that shows what the student numbers are for these? We can't seem to find it. Oh, this right here? Oh. Here you go. <laughs> yep. It has all the statistics right there. there. Yeah. Go. Yeah, we put that in. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. It has all, that has all the, the numbers. And we didn't have it at hand up because they didn't change. Yeah. You could also look at your meeting uh, four materials. Uh, and I think that they would be in, they would be in there as well. Um, but yeah, so any other thoughts? You guys have any other comments to make about the three options? I, it sounds like you're really d just further understanding the three options. You're, it looks like you're kind of beyond the point of making new options and changing options other than some fine tuning adjustments to look at that we that, that the groups have identified. Um, but you're really kind of looking at one of the three of these as which one is the most viable for, for a recommendation as, uh, from what I'm gathering. Let me get you a microphone. I, I was just going to say that we spent a lot of time discussing whether uh, option A could be eliminated. At this point, well, I would say that we, um, if you know, what I would say is that we, we're not in a position to eliminate an option tonight. I think though, but if you, if I think both groups have talked about some of the weaknesses of A, and I don't think that there's sort of a divided house on that. That's something that we can talk more heavily at the next meeting as we go through, uh, as you start to work towards recommendation. But it sounds like option A is one that's not uh, that's not favorable for for various reasons that you've stated. So what about um, a nearby um, like Cromwell accepting students in through the magnet program locally? Okay. More students to give it some relief. Could, well, I mean, it could, there's some, I know Cromwell's not in our study area, and there are certainly students in this region that are probably magnet and open enrolling into Cromwell. W when we estimate our enrollment, we're factoring in the, the, the nature of students coming and going in and out of zone when we estimate our enrollment. So we're accounting for students that are coming in from out of zone and students that are leaving, and that includes Cromwell. But I don't know, is in the terms of the magnet process for Cromwell, is it is it open for anybody in the entire county, or is it does it give... Any definition for? The magnet's an open lottery. An open lottery for anybody in the county who wants to enroll. They, 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 they put their names in the lottery and, they, and they're chosen it through a process, a lottery process. Now there are transportation limits within, with it, within applying. So it's understood that there are certain transportation zones Otherwise, the parent is responsible for providing their own transportation. Oh, okay. If a parent is willing to transport their child, knowing that the county will not provide transportation, then they are able to do that. Okay. So within a certain, within a smaller region, if a student uh, is accepted into Cromwell, they will transport them from out of zone within a certain region. But beyond a certain, uh, beyond that, it just they don't get any transportation provided. So, um, so Crom there are Cromwell students living in these areas that are that live in Pleasant Plains and Hampton and Halstead that I'm sure that go to Cromwell. If we looked at a map showing all the Cromwell students, um, but we as a committee don't have the ability to um, expand that 
parameter or change the way that they're enrolling students. It's something that you, that, you, know, you could, could uh, bring to the board and the board could consider, but that's, really, that's a higher level decision in terms of how the building is populated, how the magnet uh, process works in enrolling students. You're, you're thinking of give, assign more students to Cromwell or give more students the opportunity from this area to go to Cromwell to further reduce the overcrowding. So why was it the, the magnet was to help resolve overcrowding in the regions. So I'll, I'll take note of that. It's something that I'll, you know, like uh, along with recommendation, there are other things, other food for thought that the committee talks about. And I can certainly mention that to the board and other things that, you know, because you guys have really been struggling with trying to figure out how to give relief but not create other overcrowding situations. And, and, and that's one that you've thought about, you know, because Cromwell, you look at that and you see it next door, and I know that's hard to, um, to, to, to not have into consideration. So I'll add that as a note to, to, to mention it to the board as well. Any other thoughts from you guys or, uh, or discussions about the three maps? Did you have, you want to say something, Ms. Uh, Kaiser? You want to share? Okay. Um, so then what, so then what we're going to do then is we're just going to go ahead. I think that we've, We've covered, um, we've covered our ground. I think that you guys have looked at the maps. I would encourage you to keep, keep looking at these and thinking about the next meeting, which is December the 11th. That's when you're going to be formulating a recommendation. And, um, and so just as leading up to that, um, we don't have any new um, maps to generate. So the statistics and information that you have will, um, will be used to help support that, that recommendation. That's going to be here at Lock Raven Academy. And like I said, the recommendation to the board will be February the 11th, and that's when we're going to be presenting a recommendation to the Board of Education. Then the board is going to host a, a, a board hearing on February 26th at Lock Raven High School. We'll then invite the public to come talk with them about the, um, about the recommendation, and then the board is expected to, to vote on a plan on March 10th, okay? All right, well... Thank you very much. We'll, uh, we'll adjourn now. We'll let you guys go home, and we'll see you on December the 11th.